Hello, I'm Seafood Source Editor Sean Murphy, and welcome to another edition of Seafood Source TV, the bi-weekly video blog where we bring you news, information, and insights into the world of the seafood industry. Well, we've had a number of major developments over the past few weeks that could have an impact on American seafood importers and American fishermen in the Pacific. First, on June 17th, President Barack Obama announced a proposal to expand the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument, first established in 2009 as a marine life preserve. The expansion proposal drew praise from NGOs and criticism from, an, from area fisheries. And then just three days later, on June 20th, the U.S. State Department issued its annual Trafficking in Persons report where it downgraded Thailand from Tier 2 watch to the lowest grade of Tier 3. This gives the Obama administration the option of invoking sanctions of some kind against Thailand, which has been widely criticized for enabling human slavery in several industries, including its fishing industry. And late last week, the controversial catfish pro inspection program driven by U.S. Senator Thad Cochran was causing more headaches with protests against the program from a number of Asian nations threatening a to derail a key Asia-Pacific trade agreement. Well, it's given the American seafood industry a lot to think about over the past few weeks, and here to help us kind of break it all down from the American perspective is Gavin Gibbons. He's a spokesman for the National Fisheries Institute, and he joins us via Skype from the group's McLean, Virginia offices. Gavin, good to see you again today. Good seeing you. Thanks for having me, Sean. Well, let's uh, start with the expansion uh, project a proposal by the Obama administration. You know, we got a release today from members of the Western Pacific Regional Fishery Management Council, and uh, they're saying that Obama betrayed fishermen and said that it would be a serious blow to struggling fisheries in the Pacific, uh, and yet it would not really benefit all that much as far as conservation goes. Just kind of curious, first of all, uh, does NFI have any members uh, that far out in the, into the territories? And if so, what are you hearing from them? Sure, you know, Sean, it, it's interesting uh, because you have to look at what the Obama administration is uh, proposing uh, with this uh, from the perspective of how we regulate our own fisheries. And, and as you know, uh, NOAA is really a top shelf uh, fisheries regulation uh, group. In fact, they may be the best in the world. So when you look at something like this, it raises a question. The first question is, is, is this science based? And if it is, let's see the science. Because we're not just trying to preserve things, we're, we're trying to manage fisheries. So if this is a fisheries management effort, um, we'd like to see the science behind it. And I think that's, the, that's an important thing. This, is, this process and even this discussion is really in its infancy. So uh, at this point, we want to see what it is that this proposal uh, intends to accomplish in the end. Well, not long after that June 17th announcement, I think it was uh, NFI that said that they wanted to have a seat at the table in further negotiations. I think that's what you're referring to. What exactly are you guys uh, hoping to, to, to have in this? What kind of a role do you want to have in this ongoing discussion? Sure, that, that same announcement had a number of things uh, that, that piqued our interest. Um, obviously, we want to make sure that, uh, that any type of closure or any type of uh, management effort uh, is science-based. But also, they talked about, um, talk about fish fraud. Um, and as, as you know, NFI uh, and its members are members of the Better Seafood Board, and we've really been out front uh, on fish fraud. And we've been out front because we want to make sure that people understand, and that, that the State Department in this particular case, understands that the rules and the regulations and the laws that we need to get at that particular challenge are already on the books. This isn't a scenario where we need new laws and we need new regulations. We want, to, we, want, we want them to look at what's already on the books and then talk about things like enforcement. So us having a seat at the table really means bringing that voice to this, to this discussion. How much danger do you think there is to some of the fisheries out in the Pacific if this expansion zone does actually go in? Do you, they're talking like it could actually really maybe even kill some of the fisheries or shut them down. What do you think about that? Is that a realistic uh, uh, fear? Well, again, it, this is, like I said, it, this, is, this discussion is in its infancy, so we really need to know exactly what this impact would be and what the intended impact is. That, that's the important thing. What do they intend to do with this closure, and what's the science behind it? I think once we have those type of things on the table, we'll have a better uh, perspective on it, and I think some of the folks on the West Coast um, will have a better understanding of what it is uh, that they want. So um, this is really a, an evolving discussion, and we want to make sure that we're part of it. Okay. Let's speak. You mentioned the State Department before. Let's talk about the trafficking report that came out a few days later after that. 
Uh, everybody has, it wasn't a big surprise. I think we've been hearing about this coming for probably a good six months or so now. But uh, now that it's here, the big question is what's next? And obviously we have to kind of wait on the Obama administration. But are you getting any sense at all that there's going to be any kind of move at this point, any kind of sanctions, any kind of uh, uh, trade restrictions or b barriers of any kind that might come up as a result of this? Well, you know, Sean, we don't know just yet. Um, and that this too, as you mentioned, uh, came in the same week as the ta Ocean's Task Force was announced. Um, so, uh, so this is something that's evolving as well. But, but we also have to remember that the TIP report uh, is a government-to-government -government report. This is not something that is a government-to-business report or something that it would be, you know, for instance, pointing at a, a specific business entity and saying, you know, there's a challenge or a problem here that you need to. Get at. What they're saying is the State Department is saying in this particular case that the Thai government needs to do a better job of addressing this issue. So right now we're really on that government to government level. Well, you know, it's it's it, what's interesting is it's not it's not a black or white issue really from what we're seeing here. You know, there are some companies Obviously, there are fishing companies out there that are involved in this sort of trafficking issues, but there are a number of companies that, that aren't. And even Steve Trent, who is the director of the Environmental Justice Foundation, which has been kind of spearheading a lot of the exposure of this ever since last year, even he told us recently that he doesn't want to see any kind of blunt force or broad-based uh, uh, sanction or boycott or anything like that, because that could punish some of the companies out there that are doing things right. I mean, uh, my understanding is NFI is following along the same lines. You know, John Connolly was talking to us about it as well. Uh, so it's, it sounds like if you guys were leaning toward any kind of sanctions or anything like that, it would have to be something that is focused, that is sharply defined. Is, is that uh, the gist of it? Sean, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, our members have been very, very open uh, and vocal about this. They have zero tolerance for uh, labor issues uh, of the kind that we're talking about. I mean, they really have a zero tolerance for it. Um, and when, when people talk about things like boycotts, um, that's kind of old thinking. I mean, you know, boycotts don't work because what happens is you take uh, the entity that probably has the most unique uh, ability to drive the market and to drive change and you remove it from the scenario, you remove it from the situation. Um, and you know, who fills that vacuum? Who fills in behind these reasonable, responsible companies? That's a real question. You could actually make the problem worse. So in this particular case, the talk of sanctions or talk of um, boycotts are, are certainly premature, and, and they may not work at all if that's what's being discussed. Yeah, that's the yeah, question. Yeah, that's the I mean, question. I mean, is it possible to, to, to levy, sanctions levy sanctions or trade barriers of some kind that are targeted that, are targeted that, that finally, finally, or is it really, is it really the, just, just not, the not the instrument to control this kind of thing? Well, again, the report is government to government, so there are things that have gone into place almost immediately. Um, in terms of this, uh, and that is you know, the federal government can't spend money, we're talking about seafood, they can't spend money on, federal money on Thai seafood, um, just the way they can't uh, spend federal money on other Thai products uh, based on their their uh, downgrading to tier three. So there is some impact, again, but it's government to government. Uh, when you look at the, the world of seafood and you look at um, our members, those are the folks who are you know, constantly in contact with their partners in the region and are, and are right now you know, insisting that this issue be addressed um, if it hasn't been already. You know, we talked about the, uh, the, the EJF earlier, but also there were, we have to talk about the Guardian story that came out last month now talking about, uh, in particular, CP Foods, of course, a major supplier over there, uh, and how the Guardian exposed uh, connections between CP and some fishing companies that are, are, are sourcing fish meal and they're using some of this trafficking there. Uh, some critics are saying that CP is getting a bit of a, a, a bad rap uh, out of this, that, uh, that it's, even for the companies over there, it's really difficult to kind of police where your, 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 your fish meal is being sourced from. What's, what's your take on this? Is, 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 it, is there any way to, to know, you know whether or not CP should be punished or criticized for this or if we should maybe look at this with a more open mind? Well, I, th I think it's important to look at, you know, and I can speak to NFI members. You know, we, we encourage our members uh, to do audits. We encourage them to audit their own value chain. In fact, uh, you know, we provided a service for our members where we essentially audited the auditors. We looked at the leading uh, social responsibility standards, uh, and we came up with a list of those that are uh, that really sort of make, make the grade. And, and there was eight of them that really made the grade, and we provided that to our 
um, to our members. So, you know, our members are looking at this from a perspective of what can we do to ensure that, we'll, that our value chain is free of these labor challenges. And I think you know, companies that are serious about that, about this, are already doing it. Yeah, and that's the scary part, isn't it? I mean, you're talking about uh, uh, Carrefour, uh, which after seeing the Guardian article, immediately suspended its pur purchasing from uh, CP, and everybody talked about whether that was a good idea or not. But the one thing that nobody seems to be paying attention to, uh, Carrefour also mentioned that they did actually conduct a social, I think they called it a social audit last year, where they went to CP Foods and, and examined their operation to see if any of this stuff was happening. And clearly that, you know, if the Guardian article is accurate, it would th seem that, that Carrefour didn't look closely enough at the operation. Are you guys uh, looking at this example and maybe, uh, maybe is NFI revising its own guidelines even further to its members as a result of that? Well, Sean, we do, we do encourage them to use the, this type of audits that we're talking about. I mean, the, these audits can be an important and powerful tool. But it's also important to remember that the tip report itself is something that is not forward-looking. It's not something that tracks along with what's happening right now or what's happening even in the last six months. It's something that looks back uh, at the year before. So we're talking about 2013. We're looking back at 2013. We're not looking at the potential progress that, for instance, the Thai government has made. So we want this to be uh, you know, an, an evolutionary process. We want this to be as up-to-date as possible. And if we're hearing, or if our companies are hearing about individual, specific allegations, we want to know about it. We want to know about it so that we can get it to uh, the law enforcement, uh, you know, the, the regulatory authority in, for instance, Thailand that can do something about it. It sounds like uh, that's really the issue is, is vigilance on the part of the industry. I mean, you, you, governments, you can, you can ask the governments to do it. You can even ask our government, you know, the United States government, to levy sanctions. But in the end, it sounds like it's really kind of an industry to industry, industry issue. Is that where we should be uh, focusing efforts? Well, internally, certainly the industry needs to, you know, to understand and address it um, at every turn. I and mean, there's no question. I mean, as I mentioned, we have zero tolerance for this type of stuff. Nobody wants. Uh, labor abuses in their value chain. That, that is for sure. Um, but the, the impact of the tip report long term perhaps can be um, an increase, which we have seen and which the ties have actually been able to demonstrate, um, this increase in both prosecutions and law enforcement efforts broadly. Now remember, the tip report doesn't just look at uh, you know, for all of these countries. So there are a lot of issues associated um, with labor in, in terms of migration um, but you know the government can make changes, and the government can uh, refocus and redouble its efforts. Um, and in this particular case, we have heard quite a bit about that uh, from the ties already. Okay, uh, moving on to the last issue, we're talking about the catfish program again, and I know this is uh, a, a, a subject that NFI has been uh, expressing its opinion about many times, even here on Seafood Source TV. Uh, just curious as to your thoughts on the latest, uh, if, if the latest developments. There was a group of Asian Pacific nations that sent a letter to the trade ambassador, I think it was, in the, to the United States uh, last week saying that they, they were really concerned about this, this catfish program. And, you know, they didn't come out and threaten that it's going to derail the whole trade deal, but it's certainly a factor and certainly a roadblock here. Uh, what are your thoughts? Do you think that this uh, catfish program is really going to put this, this uh, trade deal in danger? Well, I think we have to look at this from a perspective um, of what's at stake here. Um, and what's at stake is way beyond seafood when it comes to the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and when it comes to the WTO. Um, you know, the, the impact of this program, I mean, it's a $170 million program that's been $20 million over four years and done nothing. Um, so certainly it's a waste uh, from a domestic standpoint. Um, to taxpayers, but when we're talking about impact, it, the impact is far greater than just on catfish producers or even Pangasius importers. Um, if there were uh, problems in TPP or if there continue to be problems in the WTO um, with this program, we're looking at an impact on beef, corn, soy. These are U.S. ag exports. Um, and the, the, the irony, of course, is that we don't export any catfish. So catfish would not be affected by this at all. Other commodities would be affected by it. And a very important, very large trade um, you know, endeavor in TPP 
uh, you know, could be in jeopardy because of it. So this is a much bigger issue than, than a lot of people think it is. Do, do, these Asia, do you think that these Asian nations are, are, are using the CAFISH program to, are, are they kind of, you think they're holding the agreement hostage? Well, I mean, however you define it, I mean, these are legitimate things that need to be raised during these negotiations. So when you're talking about ironing out a deal for TPP, these are things that need to be discussed and need to be on the table. So, um, you know, I don't think I would say it's holding it hostage, but, but I would say that it's something that has risen to the level of being as important to be discussed there. Well, those are my words, not yours. I won't hold you to that. Thanks very much for your time, Gavin. Appreciate it today. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate it. Gavin. Gavin Gibbons is a spokesperson for the National Fisheries Institute, which is, of course, a, a national institute here in the United States that represents and uh, advocates for the U.S. seafood industry. They're based in McLean, Virginia, talking to us today about a number of issues that are affecting the American seafood industry. That's it for this week, but keep, be sure to check back in two weeks for another edition of Seafood Source TV, where we bring you more news, information, and insights into the world of the seafood industry. Till then, I'm Seafood Source Editor Sean Murphy saying thanks for watching, and we'll see you online.